Okay, let's uh, start on part two. So we've seen what the problem is. Uh, let's see how things we can do in our homes to affect the amount of carbon dioxide. What's it all got to do with my home? And the answer is that the way we use energy in our homes gives rise to CO2 emissions. It doesn't have to, but we've made technology choices that mean that it does. In fact, a typical home, a typical family home, emits about three tons of carbon dioxide per year. Now that's way more than all the rubbish that you take out or that you recycle. It's a phenomenal, just sheer mass of stuff. And you probably have no consciousness that you're emitting anything at all. Uh, so let's take a look at how it, how you get to emit these things and see how we can stop emitting. So this, this, this amounts over the whole UK to more than 30% of our emissions. So if we can live our lives, we can be just as comfortable, but without emitting carbon dioxide, then we're doing a wonderful thing. So how, uh, how does this come about that we're emitting so much carbon dioxide? So because this is for sixth form, I just want to remind you some things about units of energy and power. So energy is the SI unit is the joule and power, the SI unit is one joule per second, which is one watt. And a thousand joules per second is a kilowatt, kW. Now, uh, some of those units are used when we're talking about uh, energy in the domestic uh, and industrial realm. But uh, people often use a different energy unit of the kilowatt hour, which is the amount of uh, energy that's used if you use one kilowatt of power for one hour. So it's 1000 watts for 3600 seconds. Uh, and that makes 3.6 megajoules, 3, 3, 3,600,000 joules, 3.6 megajoules. Uh, and we can talk about different types of energy, a kilowatt hour of thermal energy often has this TH subscript uh, or a kilowatt hour of electrical energy. Uh, and then the other thing I want to talk to you about is energy conversion. So one of the ways we get energy in the UK is by burning the gas methane. It's called natural gas uh, uh, and uh, the methane is burned uh, and it reacts with the oxygen to give CO2, the problem, and water vapour. And now this chemical energy can be converted to thermal energy and that could be 100% efficient. You can get hold of all the energy from the uh, chemical that was locked up in chemical bonds in thermal energy. Uh, now we'd like to be able to convert that to mechanical energy but remember thermal energy is the chaotic motion of atoms and mechanical energy is the coherent motion of all the atoms moving together. So we can't uh, extract all that energy uh, because we, we can't go from chaos to order uh, without doing some work. Uh, and so the, this efficiency is limited by thermodynamics and it can never be 100% efficient. Typically in devices we use, it's 30% to 50% efficient. So for example, in, your, in, a, in a motor car, a petrol engine motor car, uh, when you, the chemical energy in the petrol, you throw away 70% of it and you just use 30% to drive the car. If you are in a jet aeroplane, you can get hold of 50% of the energy of the fuel and then you throw away the other 50% as heat. And then we can convert mechanical energy to electrical energy in a dynamo uh, or something like that, with, and that's with typically 90% efficient. So how do we get the energy in our homes? Well, what we do is we go out into the North Sea, for example, or other parts of the world, and we drill down into rocks uh, and there, there are tiny bubbles trapped in, uh, trapped in the interstices of rocks uh, of methane. And when we drill through there, we can, the methane bubbles out or we can force it out and it flows along pipes. It's all cleaned up along the way. And typically it goes to an electrical power plant here where it's burned uh, with about 50% efficiency in a power plant. Uh, and that makes electricity that comes through a transformer that comes into our home. And every kilowatt hour of electrical energy we use produces about 0.45 uh, kilograms of carbon dioxide, typically. And look at all the conversions here. Chemical goes to thermal, goes to mechanical, goes to electrical. That's the process going on here. But we can also take this gas and flow it directly into our homes. 
and feed it into, for example, a gas boiler or a gas cooker. I mean, a gas boiler would convert the chemical to thermal energy, and now the emissions per kilowatt hour of thermal energy we get here is about 0.2 kilograms. Uh, so that's energy coming into the home. Now, if that were the only source of energy, would be uh, we'd be in a very difficult situation. But fortunately, we have wind and solar. And these produce very low amounts of carbon dioxide per unit of uh, electrical energy they supply us. So this is the situation in, in your home. Uh, for every kilowatt hour of gas, you're emitting about 0.2 kilograms of carbon dioxide. And for every kilowatt hour of electricity you use, it's about 0.22 kilograms of CO2 in the UK uh, in 2021. That was the 0.22 was the average value in 2021 and typically we use 2,900 kilowatt hours in a home a home with uh, two adults and half a child uh, that's 638 kilograms of co2 and typically we use 12,000 kilowatt hours to heat a home heat a home that's 2,400 kilograms or 2.4 tons so typically a family home emits about three tons of carbon dioxide per year. And that's just not doing anything exceptional, that's just living our lives. Uh, so what we can do about this is increase the amount of wind and solar. So let's just keep building more and more wind and solar. And as we provide more wind and solar, we need less and less gas. And so the electricity that comes into our homes gets greener. It, it, there's less CO2 emitted per unit of electricity that we use. Uh, so this is showing that we are making progress. So this is back in 1998. We used to emit 0.45 kilograms uh, of CO2 per unit of electricity. But so as we've added more and more renewables, it's come down to about 0.22 in 2021. And we hope we have a target to bring it down to 0.1 in the year 2030. So hopefully as we add more and more renewables, this, this curve will just keep coming down. Uh, so the plan is to stop burning <laughs> gas as much as we can. Stop burning anything. We then want to electrify everything so it can be powered by renewables uh, and then loads and loads and loads of renewable generation. That's the plan. And it is possible to do things in, in, in your home. So this is my own home from 2018-19. That's this winter. That's, that's a few winters ago. This was the amount of carbon dioxide emitted from my home. And this year, 2021-22, uh, uh, we're down here at about point, it's about 3.7 and about 0.7 tonnes. So it's gone down by 80%. But my quality of life has not changed at all. It's possible to live a really good life without emitting CO2. We just need to get on. So what would a low emission home look like? Well, it would be well insulated, so there'd be no drafts. It'd have double or triple glazing in. Maybe your home already has some of that. It would have external wall insulation. Not suitable for every home, but can make a big difference. Uh, we would generate solar photovoltaic energy from the rooftop, if you have a rooftop. Uh, we'd have a battery that would store energy at one time of day and use it uh, at another time of day. Sometimes renewable energy, if you have solar panels. And you would heat it, not with, not with a gas boiler or an electrical heater, uh, but with a heat pump. So let's uh, take a look at all, what are all these different things. So we're going to go into each of these in turn and take a look at how a home uh, and some of the interesting physics that's involved in the, each of these uh, steps here. So let's start out with a heat pump. Uh, so a heat pump is a wonderful device. Uh, so let's imagine your home. Uh, and so this is the walls and the roof. And electrical heating uh, passes uh, electrical currents through wires and the wires get hot and they convert electrical work into heat with 100% efficiency. So that's really fantastic. Uh, that's energy conversion 100%, 100, 100% uh, efficient. One kilowatt hour of electrical work goes to one kilowatt hour of thermal work. 
and that's heat. Uh, but heat pumps can do better. Now you might be wondering, well, what is a heat pump? Tell me what a heat pump is. Well, you already have one in your house if you have a refrigerator. So if you, a refrigerator is an insulated box and it has a heat pump in. And what the heat pump is, does is not m make heat, it moves heat. It moves, we put, we power it and it moves heat from one place to another. So this place gets cold that's the inside of your fridge and the outside of your fridge gets hot. So sometimes it gets hot around the back of a fridge, but in modern fridges, they often make the sides get hot. So you, but you can feel it when it's working. So it's just moving heat from one place to the other. Well, to see how that could help us heat a home, uh, imagine that you put a box around this hot bit and you remove the box from around the cold bit. And then you said, well, wait a minute, let's put a lid on that and let's make this our home. Then what the heat pump will be doing would be moving heat from outside where it would already be cold, but there'd be lots and lots of heat available uh, and it makes the outside get colder and then it would move it into our house. That's what a heat pump does. And the astonishing thing is that the heat pump using just one kilowatt of electrical work can move three kilowatt hours of heat into your house. That's the fantastic trick. It's 300% efficient. In fact, the one I have in my home is 350% efficient, averaged over last winter. So this is what uh, goes outside a house. It can go on the wall or around the back or somewhere. Uh, and uh, what you do is you put in electrical work and some cold water and out comes hot water. And that hot water can be used uh, to for baths and showers and washing things, or it can be used to go around radiators and heat the house. So what is a heat pump? Well, a heat pump is basically a pipe and it's filled with a working fluid. Now the working fluid is the magic in this, uh, in this process. Working fluid is typically uh, uh, an organic fluid like butane or propane. So it's carbons and hydrogens. There are a lot of other chemicals that are used that uh, have got other bits added onto that chain, but they all have the property that uh, at room temperature, they're typically a gas, but when you squeeze them, they can turn into a liquid. And as they go around this uh, pipe, they're going to change from liquid to gas and then back from gas to liquid. So uh, the first thing that's in a heat pump is a compressor. So you've got gas and liquid coming around here and you squeeze it. Uh, and what that does is it turns some of the gas back into a liquid that goes around here. And then you've got a valve here and as the, so it's pressurized here and it comes out, you've got, the valve's got a tiny little hole in it and out it squeezes. And as it squeezes, it comes out, it gets cold and that turns uh, the, uh, some of the substance back to being a liquid and it gets cold. So uh, in general, on this side, things are going to be cold and low pressure. This is called the evaporator side. And on this side, things are going to be hot and high pressure, and that's going to be called the condenser. So I'll just change the color of the pipe to reflect that. Uh, so what we do to make a heat pump is, first of all, to make this a, a very, very long pipe. So uh, that the heat, that the, the, the fluid is traveling along here, and it, when it comes through here, it's very cold and there's not much vapor with it. Uh, and then what we do is we blow air over it and the working fluid is much colder than the air. So the heat flows from the air into the working fluid. And what it does is it, it causes the working fluid to evaporate. So it turns from being a liquid to being a vapor. And uh, so here we've got a lot of liquid and not much vapor and here we've got uh, a little bit of liquid and lots of vapor and it's captured the heat from the air as latent heat in the uh, in the in the chemical in in the working fluid and then we compress it and we turn it back from having lots of vapor and just a little bit of liquid we turn it back to having lots of liquid and the latent heat is released uh, so what we get here is we have a pipe this is the uh, going to and from the house and we flow the working fluid, it gets hot now because it's condensed and the latent heat is released. Uh, and when we put cold water in and it flows next to the pipe, it gets hot and out comes hot water. And so 
here the working fluid was colder than the outside air and so the heat flowed from the air into the working fluid and here the uh, working fluid is hotter than the water so the heat flows from the working fluid into the water. So overall uh, what we've done is taken heat out of the air and transferred it into the water and the working fluid just keeps going round and round in a circle. It's a heat pump. Uh, and so heat pumps are the most efficient way you can heat anything. And as an example, uh, if you took, even if we just had only uh, uh, our electricity supply only came from methane, it would still be more efficient to uh, use a heat pump than to burn the methane directly in our home. So if you burn gas in a domestic boiler, the best you can get is about 90% efficiency. So you'll capture 90% of the chemical energy in the methane. But if you burn gas in a power station, it's about 50% efficient, and then use the, send the electricity to a home to run a heat pump that's 300% efficient, then that combination is 150% efficient. So even if the uh, electricity wasn't renewable, the best way to heat a home is with a heat pump. And in the, they will be massive in your life. Uh, heat pumps will be everywhere and you'll be uh, wondering about them in the years to come. So let's take a look at that. That's heating your home. But let's take a look at something that reduces the amount of heating that you need in your home. Insulation. So... Uh, as you know, a hot thing, uh, molecules are moving very fast and a cold thing, molecules are moving very slowly. And there are three ways to transfer this energy of motion from here to here. Uh, we call them conduction. So that's where the two materials are the hot material and the cold material are side by side. And then the extra banging here, just these molecules bang these molecules when they're in contact and these ones start moving faster. That's uh, thermal conduction, direct interaction between atoms. And that happens in uh, all materials. Uh, then there's radiation, through, and that can go through vacuum or a transparent material, that because these have got electrical charges on them that, and they're constantly jiggling, they're sending out infrared light all the time. And these can absorb the infrared light so you can send energy uh, that way. Uh, and then the third one is convection in liquids and gases. Uh, where when something gets hot its density can change and so a hot material can actually move directly from one place to another and carry heat with it in its uh, heat capacity uh, so we'll see an example of that in, in a moment or two so the thing i just want to draw your attention to is a very curious thing about insulation it really when uh, we had insulation put on the house it really struck me uh, so first of all typically insulation is made of a foam uh, and foams come in two types, open cells, that's like a sponge where water can get into it, and closed cell, which is more rigid because the, the uh, hollow bits in it are, don't have a way in and out. Uh, now the heat flow uh, through a foam or through anything is proportional to the thermal conductivity, the temperature difference, uh, and then the area and the length. So as the area goes up, you get more heat to flow, as the length that it has to flow across goes up, you get less uh, heat flow. And so this is the thermal kind of, this characterizes the how easy or difficult it is for heat to flow through a material. Now a foam looks something like this. Uh, and there are two different ways basically to go through here. Uh, one is to go through the solid bit of the material. You can get conduction through the insulator and the uh, insulator typically has a thermal conductivity of about 0.1 watts per meter per degree Celsius. Uh, or you can go through the air uh, in, in these bubbles and the conduction through the air is about 0.025 watts per meter per degree Celsius. So the question is, how do you design a foam that has the lowest uh, thermal conductivity and yet holds itself together? Ideally, you'd like it to be loads of air but if it's all air, it'll just fall to bits. Uh, so it's a really tricky problem. So what is the best thing? Is it a foam? What type of foam structure gives the lowest thermal conductivity? Now, I'm not going to tell you the answer. But what I am going to tell you is this, that the foam that we have on our house 
has a thermal conductivity of 0.021 watts per meter per degree Celsius. That's lower than the thermal conductivity of still air, so with no convection, and it's way lower than the thermal conductivity of the plastics that it's made from. So this is just an astonishing design trick <laughs> that foams have to give exceptionally low, uh, exceptionally low thermal conduction through a foam. I'm not going to tell you what the answer is. You you could email me. So this is just a picture showing uh, this foam. That's this pink stuff being put on the outside of our house. Uh, and it looks terrible here and it was very messy, but uh, afterwards it looks beautiful. This is uh, the back of our house now. And putting this on our house reduced the uh, heat transmission, uh, the heat losses in winter by half. So it's really, really effective. Now it's not suitable for every, every, every house, you can't have this, but where it can, it really delivers outstanding energy savings. Now let's take a look at another type of insulation that you may be familiar with or not, I'm not sure. So this is double glazing and triple glazing. Maybe you have double glazing already, a lot of places do. But I just wanted to show you again, so here's uh, heat transfer, conduction, uh, radiation and convection. And double and triple glazing are all about controlling convection. Uh, so here's uh, typical double glazing, here's the cold side and here's the hot side. Uh, remember, here's the heat flow. We want to know what the average uh, thermal conduction of this is. The thermal conductivity of air here is 0.025 watts per meter per degree Celsius. So one of the things we can do is not use air in here, but just use argon. Argon's common in the atmosphere and it has a lower thermal conductivity, 0.017 uh, watts per meter per degree Celsius. But what happens... Uh, but these are the values for still gases. And what happens uh, if you have uh, some argon trapped in here is that the hot side, uh, you tend this air tends to rise and you tend to get circulation within the double glazing cell. And this, this, this uh, hot gas here has taken some heat from the glass and then it moves physically to here and it transfers the heat to the cold material. And this can get very vigorous, this flow. The convection, the speed of flow depends on the density difference between the gases on the two sides. And that depends on the difference in temperature. And so for double glazing, the average thermal conductivity for this process here is about 0.036 watts per meter per degree Celsius. So you see, it's not as good, it's, it doesn't, it's, it's, it's much, it's a much better conductor. It's a much worse, it, <laughs> it's a much better conductor than we'd really like. It conducts heat too easily. But we can uh, add triple glazing and the triple glazing interferes with this convection. Uh, it divides it into two cells and the temperature gradient across each cell is just half what it was. And so this, this uh, reduces the strength of the convection quite dramatically. And so for triple glazing, the typical thermal conductivity is only 0 0.0022 watts per meter per degree Celsius. It's almost as good as just having still argon trapped. So triple glazing and double glazing are mature technologies that reliably save energy. So if we look at where we are again, so if you've got a house and it's well insulated and double glazed, you're not going to need much heat. So your heat pump can be rather small, uh, but there's one extra thing you can do, uh, which is to generate the energy yourself off the roof. This is a fantastic feeling when you're in a house where this happens. You can get electricity for free. Uh, so, uh, sorry, let me show you that. Now, I can't talk about the technology uh, in solar pho pho photovoltaic panels uh, in too much detail because we just don't have the time. But uh, there are some interesting things I want to tell you about semiconductors that are in the panel. When you look at all the materials that you encounter uh, in the world, things tend to be either metals, very good conductors, or insulators, very bad conductors. There really isn't a lot in between. 
uh, and the difference between metal, the electrical conductivity of metals and insulators is something like 18 orders of magnitude. You, it's a massive difference. Now, semiconductors sit right in the middle. Their conductivity is uh, typically somewhere in between metals and, semi, metals and insulators, hence the name semiconductors. And their conduction can be very strongly affected by small amounts of impurities. And in fact, we can get uh, semiconductors to conduct in two completely different ways. So there's what's so-called N-type semiconductor and P-type semiconductor. And in this type, the conduction is by things that are a bit like electrons. And in this type, the conduction is uh, by particles that look a bit like positive electrons. They're called holes. Uh, they're not really positive electrons. They're the... It's too complicated. What happens is when you join these together, the conduction just at the gap here, the two types of uh, con conduction particles cancel each other out and you get the, what's called the depletion layer. And in this layer, there's a very strong electric field. Uh, when light shines on the semiconductor, we can split uh, from this here material. We can create a pair, one hole and one uh, uh, electron and they move uh, apart because of the electric field and then we put a wire here and they can be captured uh, and bec because we've got we separated the charges we typically get 0.6 volts generated across the top and bottom of this uh, layer so to generate electricity what we do is we take one layer uh, and we get uh, and then we connect the top of this one onto the bottom of another one and so on and then each one in sunlight generates about 0.6 volts and so when we add these up we can start to build up a really decent voltage so on my solar panels this is one uh, one wafer one crystal of silicon and you can see the top of it is covered by a very fine network of wires it's a very difficult engineering optimization problem You've got to put wires on the top to catch the electrons when they're created. But on the other hand, every wire that's on the top blocks sunlight coming through. So you can, if you look around and look at solar panels, you see every design, every make has a very characteristically different type of pattern on it, wire pattern on it. Each one trying to its best to capture all the electrons that are created on the surface while not blocking the sunlight. So this is one sliver, and let's uh, see how see how that goes into a panel. We've got wires on the top, and then the wires come over and they go underneath the next panel. So we have a whole ray arranged here, and together, all the 0.6 volts add up. And after 10 of them, we've got six volts. And then we add a whole other set, and then a whole other set, and then a whole other set, and a whole other set, and together, this panel, we put it in the sunlight and bingo it produces 36 volts it's a 36 volt battery if you like it's producing electricity and so you can see here one two three four five six seven eight nine ten this whole this is uh, this panel has got all these uh, these uh, components adding up and the, for six panels here that makes 216 volts and that's uh, dc electricity now, the astonishing thing about solar energy is this. It is the cheapest way to make electricity we have ever invented. And it's still getting cheaper year by year. It's, uh, it's dramatically cheaper than making electricity from gas by, by burning gas. Uh, the only competitor it has really is electricity from wind, wind energy. So solar energy is the cheapest source of energy in human history. <laughs> And it's still getting cheaper. So it's a fantastically good news uh, fact. Uh, and solar electricity is great, but it's even better when you use it with a battery. So let me tell you about how uh, b b batteries work. So this is me in my porch and this is my giant battery. It stores 13.5 kilowatt hours of electrical energy which is a, just over one day's use for the household typically. It's equivalent in size to 4,500 AA batteries. Uh, 
and but of course it's rechargeable and so what we have is 12 solar panels on the roof and then they're converted from DC uh, to AC current uh, and they go to a controller and the controller looks at what's going on in the house and if the ho house needs electricity it provides electricity to the house if the house is not using all the electricity available it puts it stores it in the battery it converts it back to uh, to DC and puts it in the battery and then if uh, the battery is full and the house is fine it sends the extra energy to the grid for other people to use uh, so let me show you what it's like in a house with a battery uh, so I can look at a day in winter or a day in summer but let's look at it let's look at this day in summer here uh, so this is the 24 hours of the day and this is the power in kilowatts and this graph shows you what were you doing in the house so there's about 200 watts of things going on that's computers lights uh, just whatever it is we've got switched on in the house you can see when we switch on a kettle this is when we run the dishwasher this is heating water using the heat pump uh, a couple of kettles in the evening uh, this was on the 22nd of June and we used 11.6 kilowatt hours of energy that day and the solar panels it was a bumper solar day so the solar panels were generating all through the day peaking at about three kilowatts at, uh, at one o'clock for solar noon and then uh, generating right into the evening we generated 26 kilowatt hours that day so what happens is the battery is we're running the house on the battery overnight and then when the sun comes out the battery the, the, the solar panels begin to char, uh, run everything and the extra excess energy is used to recharge the battery and then the battery is full uh, and then the house uh, it, then it does nothing and then the house runs on battery power in the evening back in the evening uh, so the extra so from when the battery was full all the extra solar power was sent to the grid to help other people uh, with their electricity needs and so what th what that's doing is it's uh, uh, this graph shows is for the whole country it's showing uh, the power that's generated on the national grid and the yellow here is power generated by solar energy from the 26th of May to the 22nd of June so that's the day I'm talking about here uh, and by storing power in a battery it means that uh, well, first, by sending power to the grid, it means that the blue, which is the gas, we don't need to burn quite as much gas as we would have done otherwise. So sending energy to the grid is great. But having it in the battery means that I don't need to draw on energy from the grid uh, in the rest of the day. So I don't need to use gas energy at that time either. So a battery really changes uh, how electricity is used in a house so at the minute uh, we have been off the grid for 72 days drawing nothing from the the uk grid so batteries allow us to shift demand on the grid to times when more renewable power sources are available so that's a low emission home it's well insulated and double glazed it's generating its own e electricity it's sh time shifting uh, the use of electricity and uh, it's heated with a heat pump typically so let's that's that and the thing I want to tell you about all these technologies it there will be thousands of opportunities for young people there will be opportunities as entrepreneurs as installers as designers uh, as engineers and as researchers all these things are only getting better and better over time that, and it's a really noble task to set yourself to help uh, stop the entire earth warming up. There is no more noble task you can do. So that's our climate crisis. That's why the things we do in our homes matter. We, our homes are emitting massive amounts of carbon and we need to stop that. So there's a slide here asking for questions, but you can email me i guess can i say thank you very if you've been paying attention thank you very much